Okay, Th thank you very much. So I will continue now actually with a mathematical lecture uh, as opposed to my smoke and mirror lecture <laughs> yesterday. So I want to uh, prove, and with some help from uh, Simon Diatlov later this afternoon, the following theorem. So this theorem was first proved by Giulietti, Liverani, and Polycott um, a few years ago, it was published in the 13th, and then uh, with, with Dyatlov, we gave the microcle proof, uh, so shortly afterwards, published in the 16th, uh, 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 1916. So the, the theorem says the following thing. Suppose phi t is a flow generated by some vector field v, so that is a smooth flow on a manifold x, is an anosov flow. So I remind you what that means. So phi t is anosov if for every x, so x is a compact, capital X is a compact manifold, the tangent space of x has a decomposition into R Vx, so that's the direction of the flow. Vx is the generating vector field, plus E, so let me use my notation Es, I think, Esx, Eux, such that this is a continuous um, decomposition, so, so the map from, from uh, you know, the flow will, will map this into corresponding spaces, and what we have is that d phi t, so let me try to write it all at once, at phi t x, well this is some, some norm on x, on, sorry, on, on the tangent bundle varying smoothly with x, is less than or equal than c e to the minus theta t v x, if v is in, <coughs> is in uh, uh, let's see, uh, E s of x when t goes to plus infinity, or for all t greater than zero, t greater than zero, and for v in E u of x when t is less than zero. So in other words, we have a decomposition of the tangent space into the neutral direction, which goes with the flow, the stable direction, which shrinks with the flow, an unstable direction, <laughs> uh, uh, which, uh, which this is, I made a mistake. Uh, let's make this one unstable. Then it shrinks with the flow, uh, st uh, stable rather, and this is unstable. It expands with the flow, or if you like, shrinks if we go backwards. And as I said last time, this is a beautiful definition, but it is difficult to verify because this is supposed to hold for all times. Huh? That's the tricky part here. So an also flow, and um, suppose this is an also flow, and T gamma star are the length of primitive primitive closed orbits of the flow. Of the flow. So primitive means that we have a closed orbit, and I count only the length after the first closing. I don't count the multiples of the length. Then the dynamical zeta function, and I'm going to use lambda today rather than s as yesterday. It, sorry, plus i <laughs> lambda, uh, like this, is meromorphic in C. So uh, I should say, what does it mean? Well, this, I will make a comment about this in a moment, this converges when the imaginary part of lambda is sufficiently, uh, when the imaginary part of lambda is sufficiently large. You know, if imaginary part of lambda is positive, then I have i, i, I get a minus, and this is an exponentially decaying term. 
So as long as we know something basic about the growth of these numbers, this will converge when the imaginary part of lambda is sufficiently large. The point here is that this is meromorphic in C. So I won't talk about the application of this statement, but for instance, one of the motivations of this paper was to prove, using this meromorphic continuation, prime geodesic theorems with good remainders, namely counting laws for the number of geodesics. But I showed some other applications of the techniques which uh, arise here. So uh, maybe I should say, start. So, so first of all, uh, so, so the, the only statements from dynamical systems that we will need is the following lemma, which is proved in the appendix of this paper, though it's standard, of course, I imagine at least. The, suppose we take, you know, I prepare these lectures wearing glasses, and then I can't read my notes. So, you know, this is the sign of old age. So, um, let mu tilde be some, some measure on the, on the manifold x times dt. So this is a measure, measure on x. Anything, it could be, there's no invariance of this flow, I mean, there's no condition here that we have an invariant, invariant measure. And this is just a dt measure on, 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 on r. So this is a measure on r. Then there exists some constant L uh, and t0, such that for every epsilon greater than zero and t greater than t0, the measure of the set of points xt, such that t is greater than t0 and less than capital T, and the distance, again, some chosen distance between x and phi t of x is less than epsilon, is less than or equal than a constant, epsilon to the power n e to the lt. Actually, I don't even need this constant. I can make l larger. So, so this means that the set of points which get very close to each other if epsilon goes to zero, if I look at the volume in both uh, position and time, then it is bounded by epsilon to the n, the volume of the unit ball, so I should say dimension of x is n, and something which grows exponentially. And the consequence of this, a little exercise, which actually requires the use of, of this statement, is the following statement, that if I look at the number, so if I call, well, I, I'm not going to call it anything, the number of t gamma star less than or equal to t is bounded by some constant e to the, well, there's something depending on t, but I won't even care about that, uh, times this. Namely, the, the number of closed orbits of lengths less than or equal to t grows at most exponentially. So this is uh, an exercise to show from this by letting epsilon go to zero. So I won't do it this, and you, one could use that and this statement to prove this. So this is all dynamical systems that we will use. Of course, the definition as well. And well, now, and of course, this statement here, another exercise, shows that this converges when imaginary part of lambda is sufficiently large. Another exercise in complex analysis. So, of course, you know, to prove uh, this kind of statement that this has meromorphic continuation, uh, we're not going to, you know, try to construct the <laughs> closed orbits and play with that. That is, uh, I believe, hopeless. Uh, however, the tool, sorry? Yes? Yes, smooth. A Borel measure, a Borel measure, a Borel measure. No, smooth. Oh, Lebeg measure, Lebeg measure. It's a Lebeg measure. Jesus, Lebeg measure on X, uh, smooth manifold. You know, I'm teach. I, huh? I got into trouble yesterday in my complex analysis course by not specifying the measure I was using with Borel. No, it's a Lebeg measure. 
on x. So, uh, so, so you see, so, so there has to be some structure. And the, the truth, the, the method for relating this to operator theory and spectral theory goes by a tool which appears in many places in scattering theory, namely trace formulae. And, uh, and again, the trace formulae in this business are much simpler than in scattering theory. So to start the trace formula, I have to do a little calculation. So this is step one, relate relate zeta d lambda to a trace, to a trace. Well, so I do calculation here. So zeta, I, I'll skip this d, but this is always the same zeta function. Huh? So I do calculation, one minus e to the minus, sorry, i lambda t gamma. These calculations I do for large imaginary part of lambda, so everything converges. So if this converges, I can write this as exponential of the sum of the log of 1 minus e to the i lambda t gamma star. And then I can expand the log using calculus. And what I get is minus, and I get a double sum. So one is over the primitive orbits, and the other one is over m from, zero, or from 1 to infinity of 1 over m e to the i lambda t gamma star m. Hmm? So this is just the expansion of log uh, in Taylor series. Hmm? And then what we do is we, op we, we observe that t gamma star was a primitive period of my orbit. So if I multiply it by m, I get now all possible periods. I repeat them. So I'm going to call the orbits the, all the lengths t gamma. So that means that this is now a sum of minus gamma over all orbits of t gamma sharp, which is the primitive period of an orbit, lambda t gamma, divided by t gamma. Because t gamma is m times t gamma sharp. So this 1 over m is this quotient here, and this is just repeating what we had here. But we got rid of this sum because we now sum over all orbits. So we're allowing the orbits to repeat themselves. And that I write as a product from 0 to n minus 1 of exponential of minus gamma t gamma star e to the i lambda t gamma trace of, ah, let me just do it on a new blackboard, sorry. So I continue here. So let me remind you something from linear algebra, which is that the sum of minus 1 to the k from 0 to n minus 1 of the trace of k p is equal to the determinant of the identity minus p. Huh? Is that right? Uh, did I get? Yes, that is correct. Huh? So that's a linear algebra fact. And now, uh, what will be my p here? I introduce the Poincaré map. The Poincaré map for each orbit, p gamma, in our setting, will be just the differential d phi t uh, restricted to the unstable plus stable uh, directions at the point x in gamma. Of course, you could say that this p gamma is not well defined because, of course, this will change with x. But each of those p gammas are defined uh, you know, uh, modular conjugacy class. The conjugacy class of p gamma is defined. So when I take traces or determinants, it, everything will be invariant of the specific thing I took here. Hmm? So, <clears throat> so this means that that what I get here. And okay, one more comment. This guy here. So now I put a gamma here. This guy here is always invertible. Hmm? 
It's invertible because if I would look at, I use these conditions here, if I had d phi, so let me see, I wrote it. Oh. If I had um, a kernel, so that would mean that I have d phi t, d phi t v is equal to v, huh? and v is inside of e s of x plus e u of x, then of course I can take any multiple of t here because it's the same thing, it's just uh, uh, composing this, these operators, uh, this, this, this linear maps here, but then this shows that if I'm here, this will go to zero as t goes to plus infinity, and if I'm here, this will go to zero as t goes to minus infinity, so v has to be zero. So in other words, this map here is always invertible. So using this fact, what we can do, we can rewrite our statement here as the product of x of minus gamma, t gamma sharp, e to the i lambda t gamma, trace of p gamma, divided by t gamma determinant of i p gamma, which we just established to be non-zero. Okay, so this is this is uh, the the assumption. So I am going to now make a make a an orientability assumption, which is actually unnecessary. That was pointed out to us by Shu Shen that one can actually avoid this assumption in a very simple way, but I will not go to this. So I, if, if ES, if X goes to ES of X, if this topological vector bundle is orientable, then this determinant identity minus P gamma is equal to minus one to the power minus dimension of ES times absolute value of this determinant. But as I said, this can be removed by twisting with the orientation bundle, but let's not worry about that. So, so if it's orientable, <coughs> then we have this, this statement. And now, so this means I can replace in my formula I can replace in my formula the determinant essentially by absolute value by changing, you know, the sign here in some fixed way. Sorry? Minus here? Uh, oh, to the, oh, here, to the power, yes, thank you very much. Minus one to the power k, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right, so I'll change this thing here because that's an alternating sum. Uh, as explained here. So, okay, so what this means is, if I, if I am going to go back, I'm going to take the logarithmic derivative of this. The logarithmic derivative then is equal to, well, logarithmic derivative means that uh, the exponential disappears, and sorry, there's no product anymore because I, oh no, sorry, there's a product, excuse me, of a k. If I take the logarithmic derivative, well, I first take the logarithm, this disappears. And then I take the derivative, so I get an i, hmm? and I get t gamma cancels this t gamma. And modulo this sign, I will get absolute value of the determinant in the numerator, so what we get is the following expression. Sum over gamma, t gamma star, e to the i lambda t gamma, trace of p gamma, the, the case power, exterior power, divided by the determinant uh, minus p gamma, and indeed there is also minus one to some power. But I will consider each of these pieces separately. So, so in other words, I will write this. So let's put uh, the sum, there's a sum in k, sorry. There's a sum in k minus i minus one to some power. I will consider this as the log, the, the, the d lambda log of zeta k of lambda. 
So it's just one of these pieces. And let me just, for simplicity in this lecture, I actually wrote formally for k, oddly consider the case of k equals to zero. Okay, so just, it, it will just, I will not have to write as many things. The analysis is similar for higher values of k. So I'll just consider k equals to zero. So in k equals to zero, it simplifies because I don't have this term here. So we will study dd lambda zeta zero of lambda, sorry, log log of zeta zero of lambda. That is the sum over all closed orbits, one over i, the sum over closed orbits, the primitive period e to the i lambda t gamma divided by the determinant of identity minus p gamma. So you see, our zeta function is a product of zeta zero divided by zeta one times zeta two divided by zeta three and so on. So what we need to prove is if, to, to obtain meromorphy of zeta, it's enough to prove that each of these pieces here is meromorphic. In fact, it turns out each of these pieces is holomorphic. And, uh, and how do you prove it? Well, to show that this function here, say, is meromorphic, let's just say, well, it is enough to show that this function is meromorphic and it has residues which are integers. If you show the logarithmic derivative continues meromorphically with integral residues, then your function, original function, is meromorphic. So in other words, what we want to do is to show that this guy here continues meromorphically uh, to lambda and that its integers, its, its uh, residues are integers. That will be positive integers, but uh, that's for the statement as I made it, it doesn't matter. But still, we are nowhere close to relating to something spectral. We haven't actually, this is all relatively trivial, we haven't actually stated any trace formula. So, so here it comes. But actually, before doing this, let me write one more thing. That I can rewrite this in using the Fourier transform. I can rewrite it using the Fourier transform. This is equal to 1 over i, an integral from 0 to infinity of sum over gamma, t gamma star, delta t minus t gamma, divided by the determinant of identity minus p gamma, times, and that's the sign is important here, and I actually didn't put it in my notes, dt. This is all, of course, for imaginary part of lambda very large and positive where everything converges using the lemma, second lemma there. You see the derivative, the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform of the delta function is just replacing t by t gamma here and that's my formula over there. Sorry, well, I want to relate to a trace and I'll do it now. And we have the following old trace formula. So I stated just for the case of this zeta zero, but that's okay. So this is the atia bought Gilemin trace formula and it was, I mean it's a very old, um, Atiyah and Bott did it for maps in I think 66 and Gilemin generalized or, or did it for flows in 75. So, so a long time ago. So what does this trace formula say? It says the following thing. So I put it in inverted commas because I have to explain what it is. The trace 
of e to the minus i t p. So, my, so you see, this is in my lecture yesterday. P is 1 over i, the generator of the flow. And I just write it like this, because we are kind of quantum mechanicians want to be. So we always want to think about it as a quantum propagator. And if indeed there is a, a preserved volume, then this would be a self adjoint operator. So the trace of this operator here, in some, defined in some sense, is equal to exactly that formula over there. For t greater than zero, of course, in the sense of distributions. And I have to say, what is the meaning of the trace here? Hmm? But you see, now we have some hope of relating our zeta function to some spectral objects. Because this looks like some sort of trace of a propagator. And that can be studied by spectral methods and hence microlocal methods. Uh, and this gives us some connection to the closed orbits. What's fantastic about this formula compared to other trace formulae except in, say, constant curvature, is that this formula is exact. There's no remainder in this formula. This is an exact formula. And I probably, I'm not sure I'll have time to prove it, probably not, but I could because it's very simple. But I first have to discuss what is the meaning of trace here. And the meaning of trace here is exactly the meaning that we at least tell our students never to use, namely the trace. Don't worry about what kind of operator it is. Trace is just the integral of the kernel of this operator over the diagonal. Uh, so, so this is why it's trace in inverted commas, because this operator is not of trace class. This is a pullback. After all, as I stated yesterday, this e to the minus itp, if you think about it for a moment, applied to a function f, x, that is nothing else but f phi minus t of x. So this is not a, of trace class. So what is the, the meaning of this trace? Well, the meaning is this, that if I look at this, this definition here, then e to the minus itp applied to f of x, well, that's given by some distributional kernel applied to f, y, dy. In fact, the temptation here is to write this kernel simply as phi minus t of x minus y in inverted commas. Huh? And uh, what happens is that the trace then is defined to be the integral of this over diagonal. And what is this, you know, sort of in mathematical terms, a trace of e to the minus itp is defined to be, I put a pi sharp, j star, and then uh, k, where j is a map from, from uh, xt to xxt. So it's a map from x cross r to x cross x cross r. And pi is a map from x cross t, x cross r to r. Oh, sorry, so I should write. It's a map which just takes x, xt to t. So this is a pullback, which corresponds to the restriction to the diagonal. And this is the push forward. Now, on a compact manifold, anything can be pushed forward. <laughs> and you get a distribution. This is uh, modern accounting, you know. <laughs> this is, so you push it forward. And, uh, but pullback is a tricky thing. 
So if you just saw wavefront sets in these last few lectures, this may not be evident, but let me, let me give it by an example. Example, pullback is tricky. Let's take the following operator, AUX, that's my favorite example, is U of alpha X. So it's just a pullback by multiplication by alpha. We are not on a compact manifold, let's say X is in R, but that's okay. So we multiply it by alpha. Well, what is the kernel? A of U of X, well, is equal to the integral of delta uh, A alpha X minus Y, F, uh, U of Y, dy. And now I, I say, well, I would like to take a trace in this manner. The problem is that I have to restrict this to the diagonal, namely I need to put x equals to y, y equals to x rather. But I have a problem when alpha is equal to one. I cannot restrict this to the diagonal when alpha is equal to one. Delta of zero makes no sense. So this means that, the, the, that we need a condition. And the condition is, if I call this the kernel, just like over there, kernel of my operator A, then the condition is that the wavefront set of Ka intersected with a conormal bundle of the diagonal has to be equal to empty. This implies that J star Ka is a distribution on, in this case, R. So I don't have T here for simplicity. And that condition is enough to restrict to the diagonal. But when alpha is equal to zero, you can't do that. And what is, what, what is the trace? Well, let's compute it in this case. Well, the trace of A <laughs> is equal to, is equal to, well, the integral, because that's the push forward, of alpha x minus x. So this is for alpha different from one, dx. But this, you know, uh, you know uh, what it is. You, you put it, you take alpha minus one times x, and you know, you know that delta is a homogeneous function of all the minus one. So this is the same as alpha minus one to the power minus one. That is our funny trace. And what happens is that we define a trace now if we have this condition satisfied. So the restriction diagonal makes sense. And the traditional notation for that, I guess going back to the paper of Martin Atia, is a flat trace to indicate that this is not uh, necessary for trace class operators, like this operator here, certainly not of trace class. Huh? So now, I reformulate this. This is the flat trace because this kernel here satisfies the assumption of being disjoint from the conormal to the uh, manifold that we get here, namely xxt. So I did write this in detail, but maybe I will skip it and Leave it to you. But the key here to remember from this is that the wavefront set gives you a very kind of brutal condition, but, uh, but you know, for being able to restrict the diagonal. And once you know you restrict the diagonal, well, this was not a compact manifold, but if you have a compact manifold, you can integrate anything. You just apply your operator to the function one, you know, the, a distribution to the function one. That's integration over the manifold. So in other words, the Gilliman trace formula is the formula that the flat trace, which makes sense for this operator, that condition is really the same condition that we verified in the beginning, that the determinant here is not zero. It turns out that the condition, an analog of this condition in this setting, is that the determinant of identity minus p gamma is not zero. And then, uh, this goes through. So maybe I won't write all these details here, and we just move on to, uh, to, to what do we need to do to prove the, the theorem. So what do we need to prove? What we want to prove is that the logarithmic derivative 
of zeta naught is a meromorphic function with integral residues. And we express this as uh, pa, pa, pa. we express this as a <laughs> where was it? A Fourier transform. So this was the Fourier transform of, of this. So I can now write the following formula here. That this is zero to infinity of the flat trace of e to the minus itp, and I can put minus lambda here, d lambda, because this is equal to that thing with deltas, and the Fourier transform of inverse Fourier transform of this with deltas is equal to this, except that I have to put one over i. Oh no, one over i is still there. Okay. I have to, I mean, you know, everything will work out, but of course, in principle, I have to keep track of those one over i's if I want my residues to be integers. Uh, have to be real integers. So, so I want to show that this is meromorphic. But now, so let's give first a formal proof of this fact. So we, we agree now this all works. Okay, so I... <clears throat> Let me write first a formula, rewrite this one more time, slightly different. D lambda log zeta naught lambda is equal to one over i. And then I'm going to do something here. You see, uh, this integral going to zero is a little unpleasant even to write because strictly speaking, I shouldn't really be allowed to go to zero because this formula is only valid for t positive. So I could start here with some t naught. Hmm? T naught is simply less than any t gamma. If I take t naught which is less than any t gamma, you know, this is a compact manifold. Any closed loop has to have a minimal length, you know. So consequently, there's a smaller length, so I can take something smaller, and I really should start my integration from there. So if I rewrite this using that, what I get is lambda t dot, and now I will integrate from zero to infinity of trace, a flat trace of phi of minus t naught star e to the minus i t p minus lambda d lambda. And now I really can integrate from zero, so I shifted everything by this t naught, some small t naught. And now we have a formal argument. Which we want, of course, to make rigorous. Well, the formal argument, you know, is to take the trace outside of the integral side. <laughs> of course, uh, that needs justification uh, because, you know, uh, well, we know in calculus a trace involves a limit and actually some rather nasty limits here because it's some distributional integration and whatnot. But let's just say then this formally is equal to 1 over i e to the minus i lambda naught t. And then I will have flat trace. That, so this is really, uh, you know, 0 e phi t naught star. This I can also take outside because that's just, you know, a linear transformation. I'm sorry? Oh, lambda t naught, yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, thank you. And Sorry? Integration is in dt. Yes, I know, I know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You, you're right. Everywhere dt. Sorry, sorry, sorry. dt. 
I integrate in lambda more often than I integrate in time, I have to admit. So this is now a trace, flat trace, of zero infinity e to the minus i t p minus lambda dt. Uh, but you know, again, formally, we know what this is. We apply the methods of calculus. Uh, i's cancel. And what we get is e to the minus i t naught lambda uh, flat trace b phi t naught minus t naught star p minus lambda inverse. Now, p minus lambda inverse makes sense when the imaginary part of lambda is very large. I mean, you could even define it using this method here, because this will converge. Uh, if, for instance, there was a volume, uh, uh, the flow was volume preserving, then P would be safer adjoined, and for lambda, imaginary part of lambda large, this would be just a resolvent which exists for safer adjoined operators for all lambdas that are different, not, not real. So this makes sense, at least in principle, though not quite, I haven't really proved anything, for uh, these lambdas. So now, the key here is to remember from what I said last time that foreign Tristan, following the works by dynamicists, uh, Blanckeller, Liberani, Baladit, Suji, Guezel, other specialists, showed that this continues meromorphically, say, as a distributional kernel. Just like my green function in the case of scattering theory. So this actually has a meromorphic continuation as a distribution. Huh? So in principle, as long as one can justify this changing uh, of, of, of trace and the uh, integral and so on, all we need to prove now is that this guy here satisfies the wave front set condition which guarantees that I can restrict it to the diagonal. That's all. And in fact, once that is proved, that provides the methods which actually have been used, even in, you can find them even in Hermandes' book, that basically allow you to go from traces to actually honest traces of operators which are mollified. And hence, you can actually, together with that lemma there, you can actually manipulate these integrals and justify this. So basically what we need to know is that the meromorphic continuation of the Schwartz kernel of this, which was provided already, has this wave front set condition. And then you proved that this is actually meromorphic. And in the proof of this, the poles, the, the, the resolvent near the poles behaves like a resolvent of a matrix. And you know, resolvent of a matrix, even if it has Jordan blocks, when you start taking traces, you will only get integers as residues. All right, so let's, let's get on with it. So we basically want to prove two theorems. Then let me first introduce some notation. <coughs> so we had this decomposition, which I have erased, of the tangent bundle. So this is, let's call it, E naught of x. So this is just the neutral direction R V of x plus E stable plus E U unstable, oops, sorry, unstable. And then what happens is that we can then have a dual decomposition of the cotangent bundle, which is basically we take the duals of this, this we take a dual of that, so this is we take duals, and what we get is E zero X star plus E U, so the dual of this will be called U star E S 
X star. Now, we can now look at the flow on the cotangent bundle of our manifold X. So what is the natural flow? The flow is the Hamilton flow, like in, in Andras's lecture. And uh, let me write what it is. E to the T, H, P. What is P? P is the symbol of our operator P. That symbol is just Xi applied to Vx. So this actually, uh, a little calculation, shows that this is nothing else but the symplectic lift of the flow generated by V. So explicitly, it is just a flow here, and here it is d phi or transpose oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, x uh, uh, inverse, sorry, x phi tx, what am I doing? Phi tx inverse xi. This is the lifted flow. And the way that this flow looks like is like this. So I draw the same picture as in Andras's talk. So this is the compactified cotangent bundle X. Huh? Compactified cotangent bundle. The boundary is here. Here is the zero section. <laughs> the zero section is here. This is the boundary at infinity. I have a map. K goes from, if you like, T star of X zero to the boundary of that thing. So that is just the quotient by the R plus action. And what we have here is K of E S star. Here we have K of E U star. And our flow goes like that. From this to this. Yes. So with this in mind, we want to first first theorem. Theorem. So this is essentially not in this form, but essentially for strand. I'll say what the small difference is. Suppose we have some operator G, which is in the zeros order operator, but with a little extra on our manifold. And the symbol of this operator G is given by mg <laughs> of x xi times log of xi. So this is the plus here <laughs> because of the log. And mg is homogeneous of degree 0. And mg is equal to uh, is equal to uh, one near k e s star. And minus one near k eu star and, and I will say why later, and the Hamilton vector field of p applied to mg is non-positive. So, you know, it stands to reason that such a thing is possible. Some work is needed to prove it exists. But, you know, if I have something which is equal to 1 and minus 1 here, I should be able to connect it by something which decreases along the flow. Because it's one here, minus here, flow goes that way. And then define the following spaces. H, S, G, which is equal to E to the minus S, G, L2. Observe that this actually, because I only have logarithmic growth here, this is a pseudo differential operator. And then define D of SG to be U in H SG 
such that PU is in HSG. So these are, then, mm -hmm. well, we know what we are proving, so I'll Then, then, for imaginary part of lambda greater than minus s over some constant, p minus lambda from dsg to hsg is a Fredholm operator. Of index zero, it's invertible for large values of lambda, imaginary part of lambda. So in other words, this actually proves the meromorphic continuation of this operator since, as I said, it's invertible when imaginary part of lambda is very large. And uh, the, uh, the difference, as I understand it, with Forshestrand is that in their paper they constructed a more precise, specific G so that in some sense propagation estimates that we use here as kind of a black box were built into the construction of G. While here, this G could, for instance, be completely zero around here and so on. There is really no condition on G except for demanding that it increases. Now, what is the intuition? And this is the same intuition as in the anisotropic so all spaces, but of course that intuition was present in scattering theory in the Melrose's proof of the Poisson formula for scattering poles, or of course in the elfer schestrand theory, that you design spaces where regularity gets worse with the flow. Think of the flow as translation. You know, the simplest flow is translation. This is the e to the t dx translation. Well, translation is not of trace class. But roughly speaking, if you, for instance, had some transversal spaces, how do you make it of trace class or, or, or Fredholm? You want to take a, translate a space of high regularity into a space of low regularity, because embedding a space of something of low regularity into high regularity is compact, and if the difference is sufficiently big, it's even of trace class. And that's what we are doing here. We're starting with something which is very high regularity, but we are flowing it by this flow. So we're moving it to a space of lower regularity, and that produces co effectively compactness, which is responsible for this Fredholm property, roughly speaking. Yes, please. DSG is here. DSG is basically, this is the domain of this operator. And that domain is just given by use in HSG, uh, sorry, the PU is in HSG. Okay, so this is, this is the first theorem. And the second theorem, which is what we proved, is that uh, we can characterize the wavefront set of this uh, answer. So let me quickly write it down so that I have uh, oh, it's here. Well, let me, let me cheat a little bit, okay, so that it's, it's a little simpler. So, so this operator here is meromorphic, okay? Uh, the, sorry, the inverse of this operator is meromorphic because it's a Fredholm operator, so I can invert it. So our result is that the wavefront set prime, so I'll say what it is. I'm not sure if this made an appearance. Wavefront set prime, if I have an operator A, U, which is given by some kernel x, y, u, y, d, y. K is a distribution. Then, of course, we have a wavefront set of k. Wavefront set prime of, of A is the set of points x, xi, x, y, xi minus eta, such that x, y, x, xi, y, eta are in the wavefront set of the kernel of A. Now, the reason for this is that, uh, for reasons is, is, is let, let's just reason by example, 
If A is the identity, this is the delta function. The wave front side of the delta function is the conormal bundle of the diagonal. But you would like the identity to be associated to the identity. And if, so if I reorganize things and flip the sign here, then it will be just x, x, xi, xi. And, and this is uh, this notation here. So this means this is the wave front set of the Schwartz kernel of this operator. It's contained in the diagonal of T star X, union omega plus, union EU star cross ES star. I'm cheating here slightly because I have to worry about the poles, but the poles actually, the residue will turn out to be only um, have the wave front set in this. Where omega plus is the positive flow out ETH. P, X xi, X xi for T positive. Actually, I should really write it as X. Yes, no, this is right. Oh, no, sorry, I meant X. This is X xi, Y A type. I've just switched the sign of the last thing. So it's just the flow. Now, you remember I erased the, our formal proof, but the formal proof was taking the trace B of the resolvent, and you would at first say, well, this is bad because this is the diagonal. <laughs> this is not so good. However, this is where this little shift, but by phi t0 star comes in. That shifts me a little bit. And since it is, this t0 is shorter than the length of any closed orbit, it exactly gets me out of this trouble spot. And the wave from set of this operator satisfies the condition. And I can take the flat trace of phi t0 star, minus t0 star, applied to this. So formally, once we have this term, we prove it. So Simon Dyatlov will present the estimates that I needed for the proof of this result. And then I will hopefully wrap it up on Friday. So thank you very much. Oh, yes. Sorry? That's right. Yes, yeah, so in that case, it's, it's the operator is P, is just the lead derivative. So PK, in that case, you have PK, which is one over I, lead derivative of V, acting on the bundle E0K, which is K forms satisfying contraction by V is zero. So this is a sub-bundle of the, of the bundle. But this is exactly the right uh, space uh, for which a Guillemin's formula applies. Mm -hmm. 